Um, and then birds, we have 25 species of birds that we mapped in this, in this project. And mammals, um, we did polar bear, we mapped polar bear, and uh, Pacific walrus, four ice seals, northern fur seal, stellar sea lion, bowhead whale, um, beluga whale, gray whale, and humpback whales in, in this. And there's definitely some uh, marine mammals that we didn't include, but um, those were the ones, first off, there was a lot of data. We included two species, gray whale and humpback whale, that don't breed in the Arctic, but that are being seen in larger and larger numbers every year, and that um, have, in the past, had some, or now, in the case of humpback whale, had some uh, level of, of uh, endangered species or red list status, threatened or endangered. So I think three different distinct population segments of humpback whale are in, imperiled in some way that, that use the Bering Sea. Um, and then human uses, and that was a really interesting chapter. So we um, looked at vessel traffic in some interesting ways and energy, um, hydrocarbon extraction and exploration, um, subsistence. We looked at subsistence. We were able to get some data from the North Slope from uh, that Stephen R. Brand collected. And we worked with the folks at uh, the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management um, to help us with some of that stuff. And then from Coeric in the Bering Strait region. Um, we also looked at existing infrastructure, fisheries management, so certain areas where you're not allowed to use bottom trawl during these months or areas that are closed off to all fishing or you can only long line and all the many, many, many different variations of management strategy and timelines that exist in, especially in the Bering Sea, I think actually mostly just in the Bering Sea, though there is management of the Chukchi and Beaufort. You're not allowed to crab there, you're not allowed to really do any fishing up there unless you're a subsistence harvester. And then there's some other features that we included. Um, some of the things that were in the atlas and some of these, these ideas and the things that we were talking about through the, throughout the, the pages of the atlas needed a little bit more information. So for instance, the weather in the Bering Sea, that's something that we covered when we talked about climate generally. But the Bering Sea is an incredibly interesting place from the perspective of you know, seasonal weather. And so we dove into that and we called those sections a closer look. We have a few of those. We dove into um, the bird density and survey efforts. So we're able to show what, where, in a density map, where are the areas that people have done the most data collection for birds in this on this project area, which is a an interesting component of data because there's a very big difference in when you're looking at data gaps. There's a big difference between knowing something is not there and not knowing one way or the other. But those can often look the exact same on a map. So being able to say definitively, we know that there is, we looked and there's nothing here versus never been there, don't even know what you're talking about. Those are very, very, very different things, but they often, it's hard to, outside of putting a question mark on a map, it's a hard thing to show. And so being able to describe survey effort is something that was interesting, obviously needs a little bit more time than a paragraph that it would be given in the method section. And then we also looked into, um, the you know Unimac Pass, which is an incredibly uh, heavily trafficked area for cargo of various types. I think on a global scale, if you were to rate areas from one to ten on the amount of vessel traffic, Unimac Pass would be at a ten. So it's on a global. It's not just high high traffic for this part of the world. It's high traffic on a global scale, which makes the incredible amount of traffic that goes through the Bering Strait look paltry by comparison. But the impacts of those, being able to, to tease out the impact of what the huge amount of vessel traffic that goes through those that, that narrow strait is and the number of species that are vulnerable to the various ways that vessel traffic can impact an ecosystem, that's, uh, that's important to show because a density map, it'll show Unimac Pass and you'll be able to see one in a minute, show Unimac Pass, you know, blowing up and the rest will look, uh, look pretty, uh, pretty sparse, look like a Sunday Drive, and then we have the conservation summary. And this is an important part. The reason this is so important is because throughout this atlas and all those other chapters, we did not make conservation recommendations. We did not put in advocacy language or value-laden language. We saved all of that for one chapter. I mean, we were gonna say it, but we saved it all for one chapter at the end, and we didn't ask our partners and our collaborators to be a part of that. So part of that is because those other seven chapters 
really speak for themselves, as science often does. It describes a pretty clear picture of an incredibly diverse, incredibly important, incredibly multifaceted and nuanced ecosystem. And it describes a lot of the threats that exist to that ecosystem as well. But to connect those dots, we have a chapter at the end that we make some recommendations on how we think the area should be managed and the, thing, the most imperiled components of that area and what um, other in other parts of the world what has successfully been done to mitigate some of that concern. And that led to our next project, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, after all of that was done, we had it reviewed again. And so the, throughout, I think we had 87 reviewers in this um, project, expert reviewers. Every single summary in math was reviewed by at least one person who's an expert in the field. Many of them reviewed by more than that. Um, and then the whole product was reviewed again by a lot of folks. We were really proud of that. Um, and then I'm gonna go through our process um, pretty quickly here. We call the process of making an atlas the data to design process. And a lot of that has to do with alliteration, but it's also totally accurate as to what, what we really do. And the first thing that we do is identify data. As I said, we don't collect data in the field ourselves. We rely on the people who've dedicated their, their careers to studying um, often very you know, uh, specific parts of this ecosystem to do that for us. And we work with them and ask for and are, are most often given access to those data in some way. Either uh, they'll help us to use the published product or they'll, in a lot of times, give us the raw data as well. So that's a, that's a really important part of what we do. And those data that we're looking for, um, there's census data, which are, uh, if you go to a walrus haul out, you can, you can either photograph or count how many walruses there are. And that's census. If I, you guys are ever taking a sampling class, census is very different from sampling. It's not the same thing. Um, and so we'll, you know, we, when you, a lot of people use census, that term interchangeably, but like a seabird colony, it's really a sample. You're taking, you're sampling that. It's really difficult, in, except in certain situations, to count every single bird. In a, in a place, but you can get a really good idea of what's there, and so we really like using those data. Um, survey transects, so this is a sampling method where um, at sea or aerial survey, NOAA does a bunch of this stuff, BOEM funds a bunch of this stuff. Um, we love those data. Those are some of the most robust and geographically far-reaching data sets that exist in this part of the world. So, you know, there's a lot of data for um, just incidental sightings on the Healy, for instance, which is an icebreaker, um, USGS icebreaker. They'll have a, a marine mammal biologist and a fish biologist and a, a bird biologist that will be there for any incidental sightings and all of that's recorded. And so we have that information. The problem with that, at, that, that, that type of sighting, that incidental sighting, is it only happens where human beings are. Um, other survey transects are done off, systematically chosen and gridded off areas where they'll fly a transect and then tell you how many of each species or how many of each family if they can't get to the species level. And that we can then extrapolate, or they often extrapolate from that some uh, regional population density or overall population density, distinct population segment density, all kinds of, of ways of figuring out what a, a group of animals looks like, how many of them there are, and, and how many are around just by, by flying small parts of, a, of an area. And then as technology improves, so too does our ability to use it for data collection. And telemetry and GPS geolocator data is really interesting. It is different. You can't necessarily use all these things for the same thing. Um, you can't, for instance, use a telemetry path to help uh, estimate density because it would be a various number of points all corresponding to one single animal instead of each point corresponding to a different animal. So there's some, some math, some thinking that has to go into that, obviously, which, again, that's why we rely on biologists to make sure we're not screwing it up. And uh, then there's, we use expert data. Um, and we have citizen science down there. I wouldn't necessarily consider that expert data. Um, it is still useful in a lot of ways, but um, we did rely heavily, as I told you, on traditional knowledge. Um, we would love it if there was more spatial traditional knowledge data out there, but what we did not do in any of this was uh, create new data. That we took existing data, and 100% of the atlas, we took existing data to generate the maps that you made. And so we would support traditional knowledge holders in various parts of the state and the region and the world 
you know, collecting those data in a spatial way and we love to tell them how we like to use them, but that should be a community driven effort. That's something that those communities, um, if they see the value in that, then that's what they'll do. And that's not really for us to, to certainly not to mandate, but or to organize. Citizen Science, have you guys ever used eBird? Is anybody a birder near them? Probably talk about birds. Nice. Uh, you guys should all get some binoculars. It's really fun. Um, eBird is a way of, on your phone, you can go out and look at birds and you can log what you've seen. It'll, it'll, give you, it'll do the, the geolocating for you, uh, which is really useful. And that goes to Cornell and they, they aggregate all these data and you can see where all these sightings are. And there's a huge community of people who do this. And so you get a bunch of data. Problem is, again, it's only where humans are. It's only, those are only data that does not describe density for ivory gulls. That describes where the density of human beings and ivory gulls overlaps. Um, so that's not especially useful to get at intensity levels of use by an animal, but you could get some expansions of their overall range by getting an idea of, of what these are. And, and odd sightings are well vetted. It's not a free for all in that way. Um, they, they've there's a lot of rigor that goes into um, what they use. And so we use some of that uh, eBird data to uh, refine and, and in a lot of ways expand the range data that we use for some of the avian species in the atlas. After that, it's acquiring and organizing data. I am not going to talk about this. Um, it's not you, it's me. But uh, I am still getting over a little bit of uh, traumatic stress from database management. I didn't even manage the database. It's, it's a huge job, and we have some really interesting ideas about how it can be done well. If that's something that you guys are interested in, please come talk to me in a month. No, anytime, you know, I'll put you in touch with the, the folks. There's a, there's a lot of value in a standardized database and in people who are working in other, in other avenues and using the same kind of data for different things, having a standardized way of organizing everything. It makes it a lot easier for everyone, but that's for another day, definitely another day. Um, after that, we have to make these polygons. We have to take these data and turn them into maps. <clears throat> and so what that can sometimes look like, if we get access to raw data, which we sometimes do and, and often, um, for instance, a lot of the aerial survey and ATSI survey data, we can have access to those, those points. And sometimes we'll just get an Excel spreadsheet that has latitudes and longitudes and a timestamp. And that'll be you know a huge amount of data. And we love getting that because what that means is we can then analyze those data at the extent of our project area. Instead of having a map that's made at a much smaller project extent, which means different things. Something that's a high concentration in an area that's a thousand square kilometers is not the same as high concentration when you're talking about an area that's three million kilometers squared or five million kilometers squared. So those things, being able to translate from one to the other is part of the kind of art of the science. But when we can analyze those data, the spatial data, at the extent of our project area, that's really useful. And now, a way that that looks, in the case of King Island, I'm gonna come back to King Island a couple times, is, so this is all of the um, avian survey data in the Beaufort Sea, and that excludes telemetry for the reasons that I described before, because it, it won't get at intensity. It tells you a bunch of spots where a single bird was. Um, the, Black is all the birds, the yellow or orange is just the king eiders, and this is just in between the months of May and September. What we're trying to drill into is when do, where do king eider breed? And so we narrow down with our knowledge of natural history, the range of months in which king eiders breed, and then selected out of this database all of the points that were king eider sightings. Then you can do some uh, non-parametric statistics and some fancy math and basically draw boundaries around um, the different what are called isoplets. So in the very smallest one will be 10% and that's essentially if you think about it as a list from a, you know one to a hundred and the hundred has is the densest and one is the least least dense. You take to get a 10% isoplet you draw a circle around the most efficient number of those ones to 100s that'll get you 10% of the population. And then 25%, you get the most efficient way of drawing a boundary around 25% of that population. And then it goes out until 99% or 100%, which we don't ever really say 100% because we assume that we've only missed 1% of all of those species. Now, you know, that's, it's just not especially useful. Um, 
it would just be a polygon around everything at that point. So we've, we've generated these isoplasts, and you can see red means they're much more dense in that area. Blue means they're less dense. And so now we can kind of get an idea of where the intensities are. And that's a big part of this atlas making was cutting up these data and putting them on into common denominator form, where we're talking about intensity levels across species and across taxa with the same language, range, regular use, concentration, and high concentration. We want to identify those because that was enough nuance to give us an idea of what was really happening and, and broad enough that it didn't overwhelm the map like this does, where it gives you 10 different possible variations of intensity of a species doing a single activity. How on earth could we fit the five other activities that a king either might do in the North Slope on this map and have it tell you anything at all? It would just be modern art. So we carved that up and we decided that the 90% isopleth, we decided, we decided with the guidance of biologists that the 90% isopleth was the most representative of what we would call regular use. That's a, a level above what would be considered range. Range is just plus, it is one or zero, binary, presence or absence ever. Um, the regular use is a much more, uh, as, it, as it, hopefully the terminology describes, uh, is a, an area that gets a lot more traffic, that it, it's a common place to find this species. And then concentration is an area that is even a, a degree more concentrated than that. And it's, these things are not equal. The space between range and regular use and the space between regular use and concentration isn't necessarily an equal in or interval. So that's also something for, if there are any statisticians, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So this is that area that we just looked at. Um, and those, you can see the orange, uh, the two orange layers of different saturation. Those are the ones that we just made. And so you can see how that fits into an annual cycle map. We've identified where the regular use areas for, for breeding are and where, high con or where a concentration area is for breeding. And then we can kind of plug that in and mosaic a map together using other data, which is what we get to next. And that's when we composite those data layers. Sometimes we can analyze the data with, through spatial analysis. Sometimes we get polygons that come out of a publication. We get permission from the author to use those 100% of the time, even things that are in the public domain. We did not use something unless we got explicit permission to use it because we knew we would need the guidance in order to translate their work, make sure it was represented appropriately towards the, the goals and the, the efforts of the, the science that they've done, but also to make sure we weren't overstating what their projects said or understating or misstating the, the goals or the, the conclusions that they've drawn with their work. We really needed that guidance. And so we would take the polygons from a, from a map from an existing publication. A lot of that exists in Fish and Wildlife and USGS work. We don't often get access to agency data. Um, there's some situations where that's not true, but generally speaking, individual projects will, they, there's, there, a lot of that is because they're likely still publishing on that stuff. And so what we'll do is, is get access to some of those generated um, layers. And so what that might look like is we get a molting study from some, um, from some uh, telemetry data. Um, then we get that breeding survey work that we all did together. Nice work. And then some traditional knowledge stuff down um, for wintering areas for this species. And then uh, some other uh, aerial survey data that confirms and expands that breeding range. And so there's a whole bunch of different studies that will go into each map. And that will, again, be shown in those four different layers of intensity. The next part are these annual cycle maps. So when I'm done with map making, or when we're done with map making in ArcGIS, which is the software that we use, this is what the map looks like. And it's not awesome. It is not an easily understood or clear picture. It definitely falls more on the category of modern art, though there's, there's, it's, there's, there's an aesthetic to it. What we then do is go through the cartographic and design process, and there's a whole bunch of changes that happen where all of those little labels are, where they need to be, what the level of labeling should be, color saturation, the different colors you choose to use. Um, all of our maps are color vision impairment accessible, so all three different versions of, of common uh, color blindness in the United States, these maps are easily in, um, digested visually by people who, who have those uh, um, impairments. And you end up with something that is 
the right level of descriptive and the right level of simple that has information or you look at this and you can clearly see where king eiders are. If you look a little more closely, you can see where they are and what they're doing. If you look a little bit more closely, you can see where they are, what they're doing, and in what intensity they're performing those activities. And even more closely, you can see how they got there and, where, and how they left, which is a lot of layers to, to, to show in one map. And to have that be clear is hard. We, we think we did a pretty good job, and there's still a lot of things that we would do differently, um, as there often are. Two years seems like a long time, but man, it goes by in a blink. So we published this atlas in 2017, Matt, and yep. Oh, just a quick yeah, question. So with the arrows on the maps, mm -hmm. how did you know? I agree, you know. So how did those go? a lot. So that's okay. a really good use of telemetry data. Okay. So we can get. It depends on uh, not to get too far into the weeds, but uh, with telemetry data and well, period, it's all about battery life, and the way that battery life impacts your data is in many ways. First off, the thing will fail at some point. But if it's logging data, what you have to set an interval at which the thing essentially turns off and then it turns on to send data and then it turns back off again. And so you, won't, you don't get continuous data of where this, the bird is all the time. You'll get a, every six hours it'll send data or every 12 hours it'll send data or more depending on are you trying to figure out where it goes in a two year period, if it's if that site fidelity to, to these sites over many years or is it just do you want to get a real nuanced picture of where they're molting and so we can kind of piece these things together and then use some natural history knowledge like for instance with king eider we know that they don't venture very far off the coast we know like in this map that this arrow right here we had it going like this and tim bowman with fish and wildlife said they would never do that they would never go that far off the coast there They'll stay really close to the coast, though they'll go in really large numbers. And so we tried to show, without getting, without overstating what we knew, which is not a ton about migration, we do know that they migrate in much larger groups in the spring than they do in the fall. And so we tried to illustrate that with the size of the arrows, um, also based on what we know about the population that winters in the southern part of eastern Russia, which is small relative to the population that winters in the Alaska Peninsula. So. Some of that is a broad generalization of movements, and some of that is based on some pretty, pretty decent um, telemetry data, and the rest is based on natural history. So a bunch of stuff. I hope that answered your question. We, we struggled with that a lot. It's a good question. So we published this atlas, and we're really proud of it, and we rode the high of that for a long time, and inside of it there's 1,800 references that are cited. Our database of references that we used was is well, well larger than that, of course. Um, got data from over 50 different um, individuals or organizations or um, other nonprofits, researchers of various ways. The 350 different map data sources and 185 different layers. Now, all of those layers will be available, those composite layers will be available for free to download on the AUs, the Alaska Ocean Observing System Arctic Portal website. Right now, the physical setting chapter is up. They're working on visualizing the other, the other um, uh, chapters, but all of that will be available to download for free. Or you can go under their Arctic Portal and just generate maps. You can click on different layers and you can see lots of different things. What's it, what do ice seals and beluga whales have in common in September? You know, if those data exist, then they're on, they're on that website. It's really interesting stuff. Um, and th so the next step is to identify these patterns. Well, we made the atlas, but we didn't identify the patterns, and that's what we're doing now. So we're taking those data from the atlas, and we're creating ecological hotspots. And so what the goal is to look at all of these data and all of this peer-reviewed work that we did of compiling this huge amount of knowledge in an area, and then try to find areas that have an inordinate impact on the function of the Arctic. And this is just an illustration. This just takes from that, that atlas the concentration, just the concentration and high concentration polygons from all of the birds included and overlaps those, just the, the polygons that are definitely important to these species. And the reason that I like this map so much is that it shows something that our, our Alaska Native partners have said for a long time, that everything is important. If you are on the continental shelf, you are in somebody's prime habitat. It's not conservation organizations responding to industry saying, well, you can't drill there. 
Well, that's important for somebody. We're not making this up. This is what the science says. This is, everything is important. This is an incredibly valuable area. And I'm not speaking to that it's more valuable in other areas, because I don't study other areas. But this, I know, is especially important. And the, the goal of this work is to try to even take this further and to be able to draw some boundaries around that. So you can turn that into a, a heat map, essentially telling you red is the really, really hot, blue is the, the this is not, not so hot areas. But we gotta take that a step further and, and really, and these are just, this is just a visualization of what we're doing, but draw circles around the areas that show uh, the most and name those areas and understand exactly why they're important, who they're important to, what are the species underneath that that makes those areas so, so valuable. And the way that we're assessing this value is with Oceana's important ecological areas method. It's something they've used a lot of different times and there's been many iterations of it, but it essentially, you can plug in data that's in a lot of different ways. A lot of, a lot of the categorical data, which means like one, two, three, four, um, or continuous data, which is more like what this looks like where you have one, two, three, four, and then all of the decimal points that exist within that. You know, it's a broad range. And binary data, you put all of that stuff together and it essentially puts it on an even playing field so you can then combine it and look at the areas that become the most important. And it values rarity in interesting ways and um, biodiversity is something that we look at, um, efficiency. So we don't want huge circles drawn around the whole area. We want to know the nuance of an area. And what are these, what are the areas that are absolutely indispensable in an ecosystem? And, and then we have to kind of decide what does an ecosystem mean? So there's a lot of work that we're doing. That'll be out this summer. So that's what I'm spending most of my time on now. And I'll just talk about that briefly. We're looking at those ecological hotspots and then combining them and assessing them towards some anthropogenic vulnerabilities, namely climate change, um, energy, vessel traffic, and commercial fishing. And again, Oceana will steward the fishes and fishing data. They're really dialed into commercial fishing um, and the impacts of commercial fishing. And that's, you know, not to say that we're, our goal here is to say commercial fishing is a terrible thing. That is not the goal, but it's certainly a use of humans on the ecosystem and one that we actually have decent data that we can look at what that impact is, how well that's, that's being man managed. Some of those outputs might look like this. Like this is our vessel density raster. So high is bright green, low is uh, less green, yellowish. And then this is the large cetacean hotspot. So we just drew some boundaries around um, areas of those large cetaceans. So the gray whale humpback and bowhead whales. And you can just see simply one thing you could do would just be to look at areas where those overlap. Now you can see this bright green down here, that's Unimac Pass, that's that incredibly dense, 10 out of 10 globally area of shipping traffic. Bering Strait, on the other hand, it's hugely, hugely trafficked by vessels. And you can see that it's also trafficked by cetaceans. So in order to really get at the nuance of where are these vulnerabilities, you'll have to do some math. We'll have to do some statistics to really pull those data out, say how much are cetaceans using this and how much are vessels using that and try to figure out those answers. This is a projection of some paths. You can see the shipping is changing in the Arctic a lot. The red um, uh, lines are, are the polar vessels. So those are, are vessels that are uh, specifically designed to navigate polar waters well. Um, and then the blue are just regular vessels. You can see that, you know, this projection shows in 40 years when the North Pole ice basically is a, a multi-year ice is a thing of the past, that shipping traffic is gonna be a huge, huge concern. It's definitely gonna grow, it already has. Commercial fishing we'll look at, and we can look at that by one th way is to show in blue, areas of high fishing vessel density. And then in red, that shows diving piscivore, so birds that eat fish by diving into the water. Um, and you can just see where those, those two groups of things, of impacts on fish, might compete with each other. Areas where that, those, that competition might be. And one thing that might be interesting of, is to look at areas that have high fishing density but low fish density. Those might be areas where fishing has an inordinate impact on fisheries. High fish and high fishing, that's what you'd expect. You'd expect people to be fishing where there's lots of fish. So there's some, and then we're looking at possibly the impacts of uh, 
fisheries on uh, marine mammals and that, that possible com uh, competition. So there's a couple of ways to look at that also. And then of course, energy, which is really tough and interesting. Um, we actually just yesterday was talking with some folks from NOAA who um, have developed a tool called the TAP tool. It's a trajectory analysis planning tool, which you should all look up. There's an Arctic TAP. Um, and right now it's a, a it's some, it's a executable file you have to download. It's free to download. But what it shows is uh, they've run all these simulations what, based on what they know about how oil is impacted by water, uh, by ocean currents and wind that will predict, depending on what the um, weather is like, where an oil spill that starts here of this many thousand or million barrels is likely to end up. And it shows that in bright red as 100% of the 500 uh, models that they ran goes through this area and then that fades off to lower values. But you can, with we have the, the data to be able to predict areas that will be especially likely to be impacted by oil spill. That's really interesting. So we're hoping to look at some of those data to see how that uh, interacts with the hotspots that we generate through this analysis and see what we can tease apart from areas that are especially vulnerable, the different ways that oil enters into uh, an ecosystem. And, and all, all right now we can look at a surface oil, but you know, shipping um, vessel spills, that happens. That's also something that as vessel traffic increases, it's likely that it will also increase or the, it, it, it scans that it could. Um, there's pipeline, you know, you have to get that oil from the platform to the shore. Um, you do that via tanker or via pipeline. Um, pipeline spill is different than a platform spill in a lot of ways. The length of time that it would take to stop one is different. The amount of oil that would get out, um, the seasons, all of that impacts this. So you have to look at a lot of different factors. Um, this would show just all of the species in the atlas and where existing oil infrastructure is. So you could just look at something like that just to see these aren't, it's not the desolate wasteland that it's often painted to be. This is an incredibly rich part of the world. And again, those, the climate change is one of the things that we'll look at. And there's, we're gonna look at um, sea water temperature, um, hopefully in a couple of different ways, and then sea ice, which is a huge, hugely important metric in the Arctic, but important period across the, the um, in our project area, but also in the Arctic as a whole. So um, this is gonna just kind of scan through some maps um, and I'd love to answer any questions that you guys might have about the work that we're doing or um, and also if uh, any students or anybody is interested in um, internships or has any ideas um, we have in the past and are always interested in talking to people about what they'd like to work on and we can we'll try to work together to find some way to put you to work. But thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, do you find that um, giving access to the, or giving this data to the public, specifically like the concentration of animals or these species and like migratory paths has disadvantages for certain species, especially like endangered species? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so one of the, one of the issues that we run into, um, and I alluded to this a little bit in that bird concentration map I showed you where is all the pink, I was talking about the, um, it's prime habitat for everything. One of the reasons that um, the Alaska Native community doesn't like us using terms like important is because it implies that other areas are not important. And so one thing that we are concerned about or are aware of is if we draw boundaries around areas that are hot spots, will industry take that to mean that the rest of the area is free game, that we don't care about the rest of the ecosystem, which is part, part of what I think, I think you're, you're asking. And then the other part, um, I think the general public, possibly there are some evildoers or ne'er-do-wells who really want to eat a northern Pacific, North Pacific right whale who might try to use our data in the wrong way and that's we I don't know if that's happened um, I know that that is one of the reasons why it was really hard to get subsistence information yes. is because they were not interested in often and and why it's hard to know for sure that it's accurate because a lot of the folks who are out there harvesting these are places that their families have harvested for a thousand years they don't want to tell me 
don't want to tell anybody else that because they're afraid of, of what you're saying, that first off their access will be changed or that the volume of their, you know, their food source, it's a food security issue, right? Does that answer? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm okay, sorry, one question over here. Did you have a question? You get back to it, I don't want to skip you. So you cut off your um, mapping mm -hmm. um, at the Bering Sea, and there's that whole southeast Alaska mm -hmm. piece, right? So actually, I actually have a couple questions. Is there any plan? I mean, this is an incredible amount of work. I'm, I'm Thanks. Thanks for recognizing it's that. It's mind boggling. <laughs> um, but there's probably value in doing the same kind of thing. Is that a project that is desired, you know, that people are interested in doing at some point in the near future? Yeah. Or is that just sort of a recognition that it's the bridge too far? No, so there's there's a few, of, you know, let's just go through this quickly. We have three, uh, two other atlases that we do. So we, in last June, June of 2016, came out with uh, Atlas, the Ecological Atlas of Southeast, which is essentially the Tongass. And it's a mostly a terrestrial atlas, though it does cover some coastal areas and inland waterways. Goes through the ecology of the forest, um, salmon, black bear, wolves, a lot of the species. It's the same kind of thing as, as this. And then we have a terrestrial western Arctic atlas, which is only maps, but um, shows the a lot of species basically in the NPRA. So a marine atlas in the Gulf of Alaska is something we would love to do, but we have kind of a wartime and peacetime strategy for this. One thing we'd really like to do is a boreal atlas, the boreal forest that covers a huge amount of the state. And that Canada, Ducks Unlimited Canada, has done a ton of work to conserve and uh, to start mapping of their boreal forest. And it's the same forest, right? So we'd really love to do that. But those areas aren't right now imperiled. Those aren't areas that industry is right now coming after. And so there's kind of a, a hedging our bets where you, you've got X capacity and you just have to kind of put it where you can. But no, there's, we are not, we have not written off DOA at all. We, you know, that'd be an incredible thing. I'd love to be able to do that. And there's a lot of really cool data. And it's a very different system than what we mapped in the Arctic. So it would be a lot more North Pacific, um, but it's definitely influential in what happens in the Arctic. A lot of those currents come from that same place. It would be a, it's a puzzle piece we'd love to, love to work on. Denny? Yeah. Couple things. One, you actually, you, the last thing you mentioned there, boreal forest systems. Um, I don't know if it's proceeded, particularly given the administration change, but NASA has a huge circumarctic mm -hmm. boreal uh, project that they're trying to launch. I don't know if it's progressed. I don't know if anybody else in the room knows or not, but FYI. There's a um, LCC, which is a, these landscape uh, conservation initiatives by. Uh, Fish and Wildlife, the Northwest Boreal LCC just put out a uh, uh, presser about the about the NASA work. Yeah, okay. yeah there, there. It's a funding contingent issue that they they have all the plans and they know what they'd like to do and they have an idea of that they think it'll work and they'll be able to get a huge amount of spectral analysis information from uh, circling over the the boreal forest, which will give you the you can essentially look at a plant and the different kind of green it is if you have enough data to tell you what species it is. And so just being able to map the density of, dirt, of, of ground cover in that area would give, you, give us a lot of insight into an area that's really hard to...